Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. That simple song, if you uh, don't know, it was originally written as a poem to comfort a dying child. Uh, the person who wrote that uh, knew that there was a, a child who was sick enough that they probably weren't going to make it, and they didn't, and wrote that song to sing to them during those times. It's endured as one of the most well-known, well-loved songs in all of the world. It's been translated in its simplicity into all of the different languages. But the song is not just for kids, and when I think about that, um, a few years ago, I got into an elevator with a man who was whistling that tune, right? Just whistling it in the elevator, and it's just me and him in the elevator. And I broke elevator etiquette, because of course you're not supposed to say anything <laughs> to anyone in the elevator, you're supposed to look at the numbers, right, as they, as they go down. But I actually thought, hey, this is really good, because uh, Jesus loves me, he's gonna be stuck in my head all day. You know, it could have been any song that he was singing, and, and it would have, you know, kind of stuck there in my head. And he smiled and told me, well, that's actually why I do it. He said, I actually do it habitually and all the time. I go through life at the grocery store, different places, taxis, stand in line, or whatever. I will often just whistle that little tune, Jesus Loves Me. And he said, you'd be amazed how many people have said something to me and ended up having great conversations about Jesus as a result. And he said, I've, I've watched and I've heard people kind of walk away whistling it themselves, you know, after I did. Even if they didn't say something to me, like the elevator door would open and they'd walk out whistling the tune as well. And there's something very profound and simple about that song, I think. And the great scripture scholar, uh, there have been many of them, but one um, I, that has kind of been lost in history, but he was important in his day, Karl Barth was his name. But he was once asked, what is the greatest theological discovery you have made about God in your lifetime? And the people present were all right, ready with their pen and all this, ready for some profound answer that'd be somewhat over their head. And he was, again, just a towering intellect. And then he thought for a while, and he said, well, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. I'm gonna write that down, you know. And, and it was a simple song that he had learned as a child, and it became a truth that he appreciated more and more as an adult. And so when you think about this, the disciples, the first disciples, it would have been good if Jesus had taught them this song, uh, maybe, because they certainly weren't whistling while they worked. Many of the things that they did in Scripture were things that they were doing just the opposite of what Jesus was trying to get them to do. And I've always found that to be a very profound thought also, is that his followers uh, were some of the biggest problem um, that he faced every day. Um, while he was trying to reach people, he always had to kind of go around <laughs> his inner circle, right? Because they were a sinner circle. I think that's important to see, that he didn't just surround himself with the, the best and brightest. <laughs> in fact, it might have been uh, the ones who needed the most uh, he kept in close. And so there, Mark 10, verse 13, we see the disciples trying to keep little ones away from Jesus. Right? If you look at verse 13, this is what's happening. They're shooing them away. And apparently the disciples decided, uh, somehow, in their mind, they made some assumptions about Jesus. Um, they just kind of, you know, figured it was just this way, that he's too busy, which he was. He was certainly busy, but not too busy. And just plain old too important to be bothered with children. Uh, you know, that children are to be seen and not heard and all those types of things that maybe were a part of their own experience. And so Jesus was kind of always uh, going against what their first assumption was. And once again, the disciples misunderstood their own master's mission. And so he, here he was trying to get them ready for his absence, right? I mean, he was about to leave, and he knew that, and he kept telling them, I'm about to go. But he knew that the remedial class still had not quite got it. And so they probably thought they were doing Jesus a tremendous favor. You know, we're acting as bodyguard. We are the gatekeeper. He has us on staff for this very reason, you know, to make sure that none of the kids come in close. Keep out the riffraff and all that sort of thing. You know, and again, sometimes we make assumptions about what God wants us to do or be that really would be quickly thrown out if we would think through some of the things he actually did and some of the things his disciples did. 
But they thought the king of kings doesn't have time for kids. And so certainly there's some more important things to do along the way than this. And they had missed his message, I think, that was just then. It was Mark chapter 9, 37, just recently, that prior verses had said Jesus told them plainly, right to them, whoever receives one of these little kids in my name receives me. Right? This is what he says. If you're receiving a kid, you're receiving me. If you're doing something for the last and the least and the lost of the world, you're actually doing something directly for Jesus. And he says, and you're not just receiving me. If you receive me, you're receiving the, the Father in heaven. You know, he said, if you receive the Son, you're receiving the Father. If you receive a little kid in the name of Jesus, you're doing something for God himself. And so in this section, again, Jesus is going to show his followers that they weren't following very closely. They didn't pay much attention. And so the importance of being childlike is, again, ever before us. And Jesus goes on to answer the most basic of questions, which is, by the way, how do I get to heaven after I'm here on earth, right? And so that would be a pretty important question. What about eternity, you know? So he keeps the major things major. And so verse 13 Look at it with me in Mark 10. It says, Then they brought little children to him that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. So, you know, there's the parents' uh, interaction there. And when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased. And he said to them, Let the little children come to me and don't forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. And assuredly I say to you, verse 15, Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms, and he laid hands on them, and he blessed them. So, isn't this really interesting to me, uh, anyway, that people are bringing their kids to Jesus, right? There's, again, the assumption of people sometimes a little further from Jesus is closer to the reality than the people who were right up close to him. They got so close to him that they lost perspective, right? So they're bringing to their kid to Jesus for a blessing. And what they're getting is a stressing. They're getting blasted by his disciples. Again, not what Jesus wanted. And I've thought about this many times. Anybody who's in any form of leadership or management or anything, on any level, knows there can be a disconnect between what's hung on the wall and happening down the hall. You know what I mean? Where you've got your mission statement where you say, we aim to provide a world-class um, customer service environment for everyone. And this just happened in our beloved Hialeah back in Miami, where someone was going through the Taco Bell uh, drive through tried to order in English, got reprimanded for that in Spanish, and there was a big standoff there, and the corporation had to come back and say, listen, we may be a, a uh, taco restaurant, but we want to taco to you in whatever language you best understand. Please come back, you know, and all this kind of thing. And, and so there was a disconnect between what somebody was doing and what the management actually wanted them to do. And so, again, you think of Jesus as the manager, right? Or the big cheese there and all that at headquarters. And here they are saying, get out of here. Jesus doesn't have time for you and your little stinky brats, you know, and stuff like that. And they're, and, and they're wondering, is this what Jesus is really about? And so, again, a simple life lesson, but it's really important to keep in the top of our mind, Christians are not always accurate representations of Christ. And I had a phrase that I coined last year that some of the kids really liked and remember, which is I told them, don't throw baby Jesus out with the bathwater. I said, there's a lot of people who will muddy the waters, right, of Christianity with all kinds of things, but please don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Please don't throw Jesus aside and think you've encountered him just because you've encountered some people who said they were representing him. Make sure that if you're getting rebuked, you're getting rebuked by Jesus, not getting rebuked by someone who says, I'm speaking for Jesus. Because in this case, they rebuked him, and Jesus then rebuked his disciples. So I think that's pretty funny, the double rebuke. So um, the way I've just put it in my own mind, in my own life, is follow Jesus, not his followers. Um, sometimes his followers are way off track, and he'll get them on track. You know, that's his job too. I mean, he's, he's managing them as well. He's good at rebuking them when he needs to. But uh, what you see is that the closer you can keep your eye on what Jesus did, said, and was to people, the better 
all of this goes. And so to their credit, these parents were undeterred by the rebukes. They didn't just say, well, fine, then I'm going home, and if that's how Jesus feels about this, then I'm done with Jesus. They did. They pressed on through, and I like that. I respect that. So they ignored the disciples, which is sometimes a good thing to do, and kept on coming to Jesus for his blessing with their little ones. And Jesus was inside the house in the previous verses, and so he's kind of there talking about and elaborating on how to have a family that that works and lasts and all this kind of stuff. And then, you know, so at some point, he, he looks over and sees that the disciples have, have stopped paying attention to him so they can shoo people away, right? That's, that's the context. And verse 14, where it says, Jesus was greatly displeased. It's actually a very strong one in the original language. It, it could be translated indignant. I mean, you know, he was, he was really, really fired up about this. And I think this is important to say that, we remember, we know Jesus to be sinless. So he, there were things that got him extraordinarily upset. But being upset is, is not automatically a sin. It depends on why you're upset and what you're upset about. In fact, I think sometimes it's a sin not to be indignant about things that you should be. Uh, a sin of omission where you're like, this should be very, very distressing to somebody. And yet some people look at it and go, yeah, it's just the way it is. So the disciples' behavior caused Jesus great grief and distress, and he was very displeased with this moment. And it was kind of like a common thing for him to be going like, oh no, what are they doing now? You know, it's like not only did he need to be teaching, he needed to be make sure, making sure they weren't teaching someone over there, right? <laughs> like, oh no, what is Peter saying to that person? You know, I gotta listen in, oh no. And so he rebukes his disciples, and he says, let the little ones come in and don't hinder them. Of such is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, what he was saying to them, these kids are a better example of what a believer is supposed to be than you supposed adults who are apostles right now. You're actually not getting it right. And so verse 15, I love it because it's a key verse. It's, he says, whoever doesn't receive the kingdom of God will by no means enter it. How do you receive it? As a little kid. And the thing is, kids are receivers. When I think about an electronic component, a receiver, a receiver receives. That's why they call it that. It, it's like if, if it's an FM receiver and it gets radio, it receives whatever the signal is. And I think um, kids are smarter than most of us <laughs> would love to admit or remember. Um, I, I'm around kids a lot, and I realize, hey, they are receivers. Uh, but, the, you know, they, they don't just the, receive the signal you think you send. They receive the, the signal you actually send. And one of the things I like about this is that, you know, in the IRS terms, they call them dependents. That's just another way of saying they do depend on a lot of things. They reflect a lot of things. Um, and so when I, when I think about that in my own life, we come into this world completely dependent. I mean, we really do. I, I was not a kid who had it all together at, you know, one month old. Uh, my parents, I was completely dependent on my parents. And, you know, kids uh, don't contribute a lot of cash to the, to the you know, overall thing early on, you know. Uh, if you look at a one-year-old and you tell them, look, it's about time you start doing something around here, you know, and, and contributing to this family and things like that, you go, what? I, mean, I don't know if you've ever looked at those statistics. It's better not to look, but what uh, it takes to take a kid from, you know, zero to 18 in our society. Don't even look. Don't look. Don't look. Um, unless you're a kid. And then say, oh, thanks, Mom. Thanks, Dad. But um, the whole thing is, no matter with this, I think, if you really think about it, I wouldn't trade them for all the money in the world, even though they cost me all the money in the world. I wouldn't trade them for that, right? <laughs> but you have the ability to receive as a kid, to receive the kingdom with humility. And if you don't receive it, you can't get it by no means. He says that you just simply can't afford it. Because you can't afford it, God has to make it free. He has to give it to you. There is no other route. There's not the full price offer or the freebie. There's only the freebie because there is no one anywhere who can afford the ticket. Now, one of the things that's great about our life, I've forgotten more things than I ever knew, but one of the things is that we have written a lot of things down. And so when I, when I am sometimes remembering these things, 
I'm reading through journals and things that Lynn's written or I've written and different things. And this one comes from when Carissa was about four and a half, five years old. So um, one of the great things about Carissa coming here is I can embarrass her each week. But we were living in Florida and little Carissa came up to me and said, I want to go see Mickey. Now, Mickey, of course, is uh, the mouse, right? The house of mouse. Anyone in Florida knows that's Mickey Mouse, right? And he was in Orlando, uh, Mickey was. Uh, but Carissa doesn't know what Orlando means. She just knows Mickey lives somewhere here, you know, here, <laughs> somewhere here in Florida. Friend got to see Mickey, I want to go see Mickey. And I'm like, Mickey's on the TV. No, I want to see Mickey in real life. And so I told her, sweetie, it costs a lot of money to go see Mickey. No, uh, it costs a lot of money. And very matter of fact, this was her answer to me, and I wrote it down at the time. That's okay. You can take me. Just, that's okay. You can take me. I said, <laughs> like, uh, it costs a lot of money, Sue. So that's okay. To her, her dad was just as magic as Mickey, right? <laughs> I just might go, blah, and then just be <laughs> tickets and money and gas and things like that. And actually, I don't begrudge that in any way. I actually like those days. I love the thought that your kids really do think you're superhuman at some point. So at some point, they just think you're human, <laughs> and they come to realize that. But to her, again, she lived every day in the Magic Kingdom, right? I mean, and we try on whatever level we could to make it that way, that, you know what? We are going to find a way to go see Mickey. And what's great is somebody gave us uh, season tickets, and before too long, we were going up there as a family. We just like, we will overdose on Mickey and Minnie and all the rest. And when I think about it, that's how kids receive, right? They are excited. They're, they don't even need to know all the de details. They don't even really fully grasp them. And in some ways, as a parent, I don't want them to. The details are up to that, you know? But we will find a way to go see Mickey. And so verse 16, you see Jesus blessing them, and he fervently blessed them. Again, the, the adjectives are, are cool in the original language, and I took some time to look at them, because it says that he basically took time with each one. This wasn't kind of a like, next, bless, next, bless, next, bless, you know, like the, the big line at the Santa Claus saying, and what do you want, who cares, you know, and stuff like that. This is him putting his arm around them and talking with them. This is him saying, you know, who knows what he said. But I know some things he didn't say. What he didn't say is, you will never amount to anything. Um, you know, some of the things that get said to kids are tragic to me, but Jesus wasn't like that. I mean, he didn't say things like that to anyone other than the most hypocrites of hypocrites, and it takes time for someone's heart to get, heart to get that hard, you know? And so I know he told them, I have great things in store for you. Uh, I love you. I love you, and I care about you, and I know what you're going through, but it's going to be all right. And I would doubt if he whispered heavy theology to him, like, you know what, I want you to make sure you know the four horses of the apocalypse, because that's going to be very, very important to your life. Now, again, that doesn't mean that that isn't an important thing to study, but I suspect, again, that Jesus met them at their level. And, it, you know, if, if I could say something to little Scott, what I would say to him is don't lose your childlike wonder. and Don't, don't lose it. You, the, that fascination you had with everything where you just take things apart, not really knowing how you were going to get them back together. My mom knows that. I would just like, an alarm clock, I'm like, I wonder how it makes that buzzing noise. And I would just take it apart. And um, so when I think about that, those are, those are things that I just did. I didn't have to have all the answers to do some sort of things. I'm going to see if this thing is misbehaving, or I could say. Oh, low power mode. Wow, that's, that's amazing. Noise. Well, no battery for you. Um, nobody here has a, a charging board. Um, so this is what it says that if a, uh, you know a, if you don't receive the kingdom like a baby, like a child, you won't get in by any means. You have to receive it. And when I think about that, you know, there's a lot of times people even have concerns about what happens if a kid. You know, if I, if I learn and I see in the Bible that it's belief and it's trust and it's coming to understand the gospel and responding to that is how somebody gets to heaven. I've had people ask, well, what about a kid who's too young to do all that? What about a kid who dies in infancy or in childbirth? What's, what's going to happen to them? To me, that, 
That answer is obvious to me. I hope it's obvious to anyone reading it. Mark 10, 14, of such is the kingdom of God. I'm not worried about that at all. I'm worried about people who grow up to disbelieve and to have their heart grow hard toward the things of Jesus. And so Jesus started on his way out of the house, and a person came running up to him. And this is a very intentional contrast. Here's what we're going to see. Jesus going out on the road. One came running and knelt before him and said, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that's God. And he goes on to say, You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Don't murder. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Don't defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he answered and said to him, Teacher, I got a hundred on that quiz in Bible class. I have kept all these things from my youth. And Jesus, looking back at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give it to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven and come take up the cross and follow me. And he was sad at this word and he went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. Now, this is an intentionally shocking scene also. And it is placed very carefully here in this spot. You know, a man came running to Jesus. As they move on from the spot where all these people are bringing their kids to Jesus, and his disciples were pushing him away, here comes a guy, and he comes running in at Jesus' feet. And he appears to be uh, sincere in his question. It's a very spiritual question. It seems to even be the right question. How do I get to heaven? What do I need to do? You know, he's not talking with, like, you know, side issues here. And after his interaction with Jesus, this is one of the few times I can think of that a man walked away sad and sorrowful after an interaction with Jesus. I mean, in fact, we're going to see next week, there's most times somebody comes into contact with Jesus and it says they walk away weeping and praising God and all the rest. So how can this be? Well, this is a really rare three-peat, as I call them. This same story is told in three of the Gospels. That's weird, actually, just by itself. Usually something appears in one, maybe two, but to appear in Mark, Matthew, Matthew, Mark, and uh, Luke is actually pretty unusual. And they all place it in the same place, because not all, all of them are strictly chronological, but they all put it immediately after the blessing of the children. Okay, So you got blessing of the kids, and then this rich young ruler coming to him. And as we saw it, the, the, Jesus had just told him, the kingdom belongs to little ones who receive it as a gift. By no other means will you possibly get in. But this, so this is addressing the by no means phrase, if you want to know what it's really addressing. The man who ran to meet Jesus was a man of means, as we call it, right? He had Lots of stuff. There was no lack he had physically. He had no lack physically. He's commonly called the rich young ruler because those are piecing together the descriptions of the different gospel writers. Matthew tells us he was young. Luke mentions he was a ruler. All three of them happen to mention he was rich. So he's young. He's got a position of power and he's got money. Right? We've all seen somebody who maybe has one out of the three or two out of the three. You know that proverbial person in the cool car whose cool is long behind them, right? But man, they're like, they're, they're rich and they're a ruler, but ooh, young, you know, no. And so you see this disciples shooing away people, saying, you keep get out of my yard, you know? Jesus wants it out of here. And I can assure you, there's no way the disciples would have shooed this guy away. Never, they would have, whoa, open wide the gate, you know, the VIP coming through. You know, they never would have in their wildest dreams thought Jesus does not have time for this person. Think of the wonders he would do for their reputation. Think of the contributions he could give to the apostolic retirement fund, right? I mean, this, this, this is it. We've been praying for such things, Jesus. A rich young ruler. He had everything. He had everything. And so he comes to Jesus. And again, you think about this. He was a moral man. He wasn't wicked. I mean... Jesus didn't tell him, you did not do all those things since you were a kid. He wasn't a criminal. He was a good guy. He was a law-abiding citizen. I think that's really important to see. He was that guy that if anyone could have made it on his grade alone, he would have made it. 
He came running. He was enthusiastic. This was actually an uncommon thing for a man of means to do, to come running and put himself on his knees in front of a teacher. Oh, wow. I mean, that had everything that seemed to be like the evangelist dream, right? A guy coming and saying, what do I need to do to join the group? And Jesus gives him one of these enigmatic, one of these difficult answers, an enigma. He comes to him and he says, why do you call me good? You said I'm a good teacher. Why do you call me good? Nobody's good except God. And there are people who have misunderstood this verse, I think, and kind of said, well, Jesus was denying his divinity. Don't call me good. Um, only God's good. But the truth is, he was actually saying the exact opposite. When you look at it, Jesus is challenging the man to either recognize him as God or not good. Because he's either God or he's not good. Because anyone who isn't God isn't good enough. Right? That's the, the whole of Scripture teaches us that. If he's just a teacher, one of the things he's been teaching and accepting was people's praise as God himself. There have been times when Peter told him, well, we know who you are. You're God here walking the earth. And, and Jesus said, you're, you're right about that. And so this declaration sets the tone for the understanding of the rest of the interaction. He says, verse 19, you know the commandments. The Ten Commandments were written on two tablets. You may know the first tablet had to do with our relationship with God. The second tablet had to do with our relationship with others. So it's really great synopsis of the New Testament when Jesus said, I'm really giving you two commandments, love God, love others. But the detail of that was found in the Old Testament in the first and second tablets. And so the things that Jesus mentions all come from the second tablet, right? He says to him, uh, don't, don't commit adultery. And the guy's like, I didn't. Don't commit murder. And he says, I didn't. Um, and so these are not randomly picked, I don't believe. Jesus doesn't really do things randomly. Um, and he says, don't commit adultery, don't murder. All the things that people have regularly told me at various times, hey, I'm in good with God, I, I never hurt anybody, I don't steal stuff, um, I don't lie, I'm good, my parents love me. And this man told Jesus, I've kept all this stuff from my youth. And I believe he was telling the truth to the best of his understanding. He did believe that he had kept all those things since he was a kid. Um, he had honored his parents. I'm sure they were very proud of him and his accomplishments. But Matthew 19, 20, a cross-reference, records that he tagged on the question first, what do I still lack? So Jesus tells him here in Mark, you still lack something. But he's actually answering answering the very question the guy had asked him. He said, I, look, I did all this stuff, man. I've been a good guy. What, what am I missing? I feel like I'm missing something still. He realized it. And there's this gnawing insecurity that he'd fallen short. And you know, it's funny, I can relate to this on a lot of levels. The problem with being good, um, and I've tried to be good. I mean, I think good is, is not a bad goal, really, per se. But if you stake your claim on that, how good is good enough? Is, is that good enough? Or has it got to be a little gooder than that, right? <laughs> oh, well, you messed up the grammar. That's, that's bad, you know? But you see that a clue to his condition was found there. What must I do? See, this is the problem with his life. It was much, what must I do? He wasn't thinking in terms of, tell me what God's done. He was thinking, tell God what I've done. Tell God what I've done. I've done a lot of good stuff. You know, put in a good word for me. And Jesus had already said it just so plainly at the beginning. He had a way of just cutting through all this, the smoke and mirrors. And he said, there's no one good except God. So unless you're God, you're, for, or you're short of that. And this is the most important two words in this whole passage to me. Verse 21, it says, Jesus looking at him loved him. Why did it say that? Because we needed to know that. Because it would have been really easy for us to look at this and say, Jesus criticized him, or Jesus thought ill of him, or Jesus wasn't that into this guy, or something. It says Jesus loved him. This I know, for the Bible told me so. The Bible thought I needed to know this. The author of the Bible thought I needed to know this. Jesus loved this guy. He looks at him with love, and he tells him this. He tells him, you're not good enough. You are not good enough. 
And I know people who say that to people without love. You're not good enough. You'll never amount to anything. Um, but Jesus is saying it out of a different motive. He's saying it out of love, saying you don't have to be good enough. I'm letting you off the hook of being good enough. But I'm going to test you on this thing. He says, one thing you lack. I can picture the guy getting excited because he's like, oh, one thing? I can do one thing. I'm only one thing? No big deal. You tell me, I'll do it. I'll get my people on it. It'll be done by day, the end of the day. And Jesus says, sell everything. Give the proceeds to the poor that you have treasure in heaven and take up your cross and come and follow me. The two words that are most important here are follow me. He could have told him, dump a bowl of spaghetti on your head and follow me. The question is, will you do what Jesus said to do? Sell everything is not what it takes to uh, be a believer. Because the whole of Scripture, again, tells us salvation is a free gift. You can sell everything, give it to the poor, and that still does not buy you a ticket to heaven. This is not what Jesus was saying. So many people have misunderstood even this. To understand why Jesus gave the answer, we have to look very closely at the circumstances and the context. That's why it was put after the receiving as a child. What, if, what do we come into this world with? Well, we don't come in with power and prestige and possessions and everything. So he's telling him, you want to go back? Go back to being like you were when you were a baby. And you just took what came your way, and that's what you got. And the man was trying to earn and merit eternal life. And so Jesus takes the price all the way up to full price. He says, it's going to cost you absolutely everything. What must I do? Well, what you must do is live an absolutely perfect life. How's that? Keep every commandment. Oh, you kept the first ones, but you don't love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. If you did, um, you would do what he said without hesitation. You wouldn't look at your stack of stuff and go, well, that's too, that's too much. God's asking too much. The law was meant to show us our lack. And this man was this close, this close to getting it. And he, said, he comes to Jesus and he says, on my merit, what am I missing? And Jesus said, everything. You're missing one thing which is everything. You're missing the entire way you get in, which is you don't get in with all of the things you achieve. You get in with the things you receive. Okay? It's not about achievement. It's about receivement. And he says, but I, I, I've done a lot of achievements. Look at them. I'm looking pretty good. And Jesus says, you do look pretty good. But remember back to Carissa in the House of Mouse? She just looked at me and said, you can take me. She didn't say, hey, here, take my... Take my piggy bank, take this, sell my stuff, do all this thing. I didn't tell her, if you sell everything in this house, um, you can go uh, to the house of mouse. You know, that was not it. It, it, was, it was that reality of her saying, I can't afford it, but you could. And you see Jesus reminding the man of the commandments because he's reminding him how high the price is. And the man looks at it, and he, because he's so physically minded, he says, I've kept the law. Remember elsewhere, if he'd been tuned into any of Jesus' sayings, he said, you ever hate anybody? You ever covet? <laughs> you, you got all that stuff without ever coveting anything or being jealous of somebody else's achievements? Ever? And so Jesus showed him he really hadn't kept the law. If you really loved your neighbor as yourself, you'd sell your stuff and give it to them because it'd make you happier for them to have it than for you to have it. You. The greatest day on your life would be when your neighbor had the cool car that you used to have because now they have it because you love them like you love you. And that stopped this man. And, and sadly, he went away sorrowful. He went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. Who would have ever thought a, a passage like that could be in a single sentence? This man went away sad because of all that he had. What? Is that the opposite message you've ever heard in your life? Now, does that mean you can't have things? Abraham had things. Um, David had things. The people of God have always had things. The question is whether things have you. That's all the question. That's what Jesus was looking at. Did he reconsider? Did this man reconsider? Did he come back tomorrow after this sorrow and say, well, I, I, you know what? I, I, I sold some stuff and I still need them no more. You know what's funny? Jesus loved him. The Bible tells us so. But he didn't go running after him. He said, I'll tell you what, sell half your stuff. Half your stuff to the poor. Okay, just we'll, we'll, uh, we're running a special today. It, it was this that he said, unless you receive it, you really don't believe it. Because what you're still trying to do is achieve it. Right? Unless you receive it as a child, you're trying to 
achieve it like an adult. And the thing is, it's one or the other. It's not a part of this and a part of that. And so the global command to everyone is follow me. The particular command to him was sell everything. If he had sold everything, it still wouldn't pay the price for eternal life. Right? We know that. In fact, I believe if the man had said, okay, Jesus wouldn't have required it. Think of all the times that in Scripture, even uh, Abraham, he was told, sacrifice your son. He says, let's go do it. And God says, don't do it. But you now know that there isn't anything you would withhold from me. And so when you think about this, Jesus knew that riches were on, in the way of this man coming to the kingdom as a receiver, as a receiver. As a person who just says, whatever you have to say to me or to do, that's what I need. And so verse 23, Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished. Mark's very um, careful to um, record all the uh, astonished and, and shocked and the, you know words just so we know what the reactions were. He says, they were astonished at his words, but Jesus answered again and said to him, Children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Notice what he calls them in verse 24, children. <laughs> he says, kids. kids this, is, this is a lesson for kindergarten now. How hard it is for those who trust in riches. See, he said a rich man first, and they're like, oh, 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 and he says, he adds the word trust. He said, remember, people who trust in their riches, it's going to be hard for that because they're not going to trust in God. They're going to trust in that instead. That will become their savior, they think. But it's not a good savior. You can save all the money in the world, and it's not going to save you. That's what he's trying to teach them. The disciples were under the mistaken notion that physical wealth was a sign of God's favor. Um, under the Old Testament law, you may know it, God had promised to prosper them in a physical way. And the Old Testament has many physical pictures of spiritual realities. But, you know, they missed the message, which God was basically saying, here's what I'm going to do. If you will do things my way, he said, I'm going to prosper you in such a way that the nations around you say, well, I want him for a dad. Why do you, <laughs> I want your life. Why, why do you guys get this great life? Why are we out here in strife and difficulty and everything? And when you do things God's way, things go your way. And, and they're like, I want that. But instead, they started feeling puffed up and frightened. Anyone who was poor, they said, well, you must have a poor relationship with God. Because God pours out blessings on me. And you're poor. So they, they used it for pride instead of the humility of saying, it's, it's, it's just God's. God's thing in my life, and, and he would want to do it in your life as well. So they missed that, you know, and so he astounds him by, by saying, no, it, it, the, the reality is the ones you think may have the blessing of God may in fact be completely outside of that. It's easier for, for you to put a thread, a camel, through a needle. You know, and there, a lot of people have done lots of conjecture on this, but everything I found on it, it's just a common idiom in the day for saying this is completely impossible. I mean, do you think it's hard to put a, a you know, needle through, a thread through a needle, try to put a whole camel through it? It's not going to be easy. In fact, it's not going to be possible. And this is what it says. It's, it's impossible. He even uses that. Because they react greatly astonished. Isn't this amazing that his disciples are constantly like, how can you say this? And so they say among themselves, well, who's going to be saved? It ain't going to be you. You've got a little money in the bank, don't you, Peter? Yeah, no. Wow, you had a fishing business that went pretty well, didn't it? Tax collector Matthew, that last party you threw cost some money. Who can be saved? And Jesus looks at him and says, with men it's impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. So what he's saying here is, is it impossible with man? What's impossible with man? Salvation. What's impossible with man? To trust in anything other than what we see and what we rely on. But he says, you know what? That's going to be harder for somebody who has more resources. The fewer resources you have, what do you have to lose? What do you have to lose trusting in God? But I might lose my reputation trusting in God. Oh, you're one of those stupid people who believe in that? What? You're, wow. You know, there's a lot that you can lose. Um, they lost a lot. 
And you see Peter saying it to him. <laughs> I love Peter. I, I appreciate Peter being that guy in class who asked the questions I wanted to ask but was scared to ask. Peter began to say, we left everything and followed you. <laughs> look, Jesus, look. Look what we did. And Jesus answered and said, Assuredly I say to you, there's no one who has left house or brother or mother or sister or father or wife or children or lands for my sake in the Gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Summing this up, Peter wanted to make sure Jesus didn't forget that he got an A on the quiz, right? When Jesus said, follow me, Peter, he did, right? When he said, leave your net, Peter left his net, right? When Peter, Andrew, James, and John had a business, well, and Jesus walked by and said, follow me, they did. And Matthew walked away from a tax collector's job when Jesus says, follow me. So Peter's classic, teacher, we did our homework. Right after this, a man goes away sad. They're not quite as rich or young or rulery as he is, but they're like, we did it. What do we get? Do we get a gold star? Do we get some cool? And this is what I love about Jesus, because if ever there was a time for him to come in and be harsh and rebukeful with all these things, he doesn't do it. He doesn't do it, but he did, he did say this to him. He says, yeah, God didn't miss that, and, and believe me, Peter, you won't be sad. You won't be sad that you walked this way instead of walked away. Oh man, that guy walking away sad, that was not the right choice. He lost in that deal, at least for now. But Peter, you believe me, believe me, God will be a debtor to no one. No one's ever given anything up for God. When I think about that in the history of humanity, nobody has ever, ever given up something for God. I felt like I have before. I gave up God, gave up so much for God. And this is what he says. Really? If you think of it on a wider case, is it really true? There are some losses, of course. There have been people who've lost friends over it. There have been people who've lost family over it. There have been people who have lost their life over faith. But this is what Jesus says. You know what? <laughs> God keeps pretty good records. And he is lacking no resources. So if he wants to give you a hundred friends for the one who thought your faith was stupid, God can pour that out in your life. I think about it in my own life. Um, you know, we have not lacked anything since we came to decide to follow Jesus. And I can remember, it seems like a long time ago, but I can remember Lynn and I really reckoning down to the point where as we were making financial adjustments, there were times where we were telling ourselves, we probably won't ever get to eat out at a restaurant again. I mean, really, honestly, we were looking at it saying, well, budgetary-wise, we will never get to take another trip or go another place or do any of that. Because it, it just, looking at the face of it, yes, that this was the life we chose. But I look at it and I go, well, you know what? God has, has given us houses in every place I can imagine. I mean, I could, I could probably go to 50 states and, and just randomly call old people I know and say, hey, remember me? You love Jesus? Will you put me up in your house for a week? Um, and, and you think about this. This is the, the course of, of Christianity. People have lost on one level and gained all the more. And Jesus says, and that's just here. That's just here. The quality of friendships I have had after coming in contact with Jesus, he has way better friends than I did. And I've kept some, which have been amazing, but I've also lost others. Lost contact with them. But this is what Jesus is saying. You won't, you won't regret giving to God. You won't regret giving your life to God. And one of the childlike characteristics I love is that kids just kind of, when it's, when it's done right, they don't worry too much about stuff like that. You just show up in places and meals will be provided. Things will be there, you know. Um, it, it, when, when a kid is growing up in a household, even households of very limited means, what I know is parents kind of have that mentality where they go, that's for us to worry about. I don't want my kids worrying about that. I wasn't always with the kids going, where are we going to get money for the light bill? You know, I just, I just, I might have been saying to God, where are we going to get money for the light bill? But I'm not wanting to transfer that to my kids. So I'm like, hey, you know, it'd be great. We're going to, we're going to play games by candlelight tonight. Or whatever. <laughs> I'm going to do it old 
that's true. And kids are just naturally generous. They are. When you're around them, they're just naturally gener generous. I was thinking back to this. I used to have to clean out my office. And again, I wrote it down. I was reading through something I had written. And at the end of each day, this was the offering from one day. Two Barbies, a stuffed dog, some stickers, a transformer, some Legos, uh, a coloring book, a children's Bible, a Happy Meal toy from Toy Story. Those were the things I got in one day, just from the kids bringing them in. While I was working, they're like, yay! And, you know, the dog brings stuff to you, you know, just the whole place. Just, just that way. And I think about it, and, and if you walk away, if you have, if you've had to walk away from anything, um, just, uh, this is what Jesus was trying to get Peter to, to see. Yeah, Peter, I know. I know, keep reminding me. But he's like, God already, you don't need to remind God. He knows. But he has a way of returning more than you've ever, ever had to throw his way. But the man who walked away sorrowful, who was holding on, with his hands holding on, there was less than God's hand pouring out. And that's where Jesus says, many who are first will be last, the last first. The, the people who you think were VIP might not be in eternity, but the people who you thought were at the end of the line might be in a very good position in God's world. And remember, the disciples, and especially in that society, just to tie it all together, in that society, children were not valued. In our, I know sometimes we read it through our eyes, but they really weren't valued. They were valued as workers. <laughs> they were valued as unpaid labor. They were valued as, you know, commodities. But we see in here that the disciples had a value that Jesus inverted and said, wait, wait, wait. Let, let, me, let me get you to see it the way I see it. A person who comes to God as a receiver with humility, faith-filled, dependent, just kind of um, a handout, you know, a charity case. It, it leaves you with that thought that he loved them both. But he loved that man so much that he's like, man, I, I just, I have to pry everything out of your hand for you to get to the point where it's open instead of you coming to me saying, what must I do? Jesus is saying, I'm showing you what I must do for you to get into heaven. So again, the song, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. He wouldn't withhold anything good for my life. So if there's ever been something withheld from my life, I go, good. <laughs> um, you know, that's okay. And he has done more than I could have thought, asked, or imagined. There's times where I just realize, man, uh, I thought I was giving things up. And I love the thought that little ones to him belong. We are we. You know, it's not they. When I look at a little kid, I go, oh, those weak kids. You know, I'm so much stronger now. What I realize is the older I get, the weaker I get. The more I realize what I don't know and can't do. When I, I went through a stage of thinking there was a lot I could do for God, uh, I'm going to do some really cool stuff for you, God. And I think, uh, you know, he allowed me to go through those stages and ages, but I, I think more and more I'm realizing um, uh, he just loves me. He just, you know, my kids are not my kids because of what they do. They're my kids uh, because they're my kids. They're not my kids because they're good. They're, they are good, but they're not my kids because they're good. They're my kids, whether they're bad or good. It, uh, you know. And so I'm going to pour love out on them simply because I love them. You know, and not say, okay, you earned the treat, here comes the treat. You know, that's I, I'm not training a dog. I am I'm loving a person. And the man asks such interesting questions, you know, what, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Inherit is a funny word. And that's what I want to leave you with is an inheritance, you know. When you think about it, what do you do to get an inheritance? Well, the, the parent dies and leaves something to you. And you go, so Jesus died and left something to us as an inheritance. What must I do to inherit? Um, be standing there <laughs> when Jesus hands over what he died for and lived for. John 1, 12, to those who received him, Jesus gave the right to become children of God. Who, who gets the right? People who receive him. Don't they have to be right? No, they have to be in the right place. <laughs> A place 
of grace, right? a place of reception. So heaven is either achieved through good or received from God. Those are the only two choices. And it's not 80-20. It's not 99-1. The percentage has to be, it's 100% received. You, you can't come like this man who said, well, I achieved pretty well. Could you make up the gap? It's either achieved through good or received from God. And you know what's great about that? The message is, I don't receive from that also the message that Jesus is always whispering in my ear how bad I am. How bad I am. How bad I am. Oh, Scott, you're such a disaster, but I love you anyway. What, what parent would do that? And if I, the Bible always uses me as a lesser parent. It says, you're a terrible parent, and you wouldn't do that. So why would a good God do that, right? Things I would never dream of telling my kids. You know, you're, everything you do is a complete disappointment to me, falls short of every th expectation I have for you. But don't worry, I love you anyway. So, that's some people's brand of explaining God to people. They go, no, what it is is you don't have to be good enough for me. You can't be good enough for me, so stop trying. I'm not counting that. What I'm counting on is you are mine and I love you and I would like to give you things if you will receive them with a heart of joy. And you will achieve more than you could have ever imagined in that. And that's part of why I think the simple things are the most profound. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Thank you, Lord, for this. Thank you for the fact that... Uh, this shocked your disciples. I pray that it would shock us in some way or another if we don't really fully appreciate it. I know we've heard it in so many ways that it can become common, uh, but I still look around and think it's uncommon. People still come and have the, I, what must I do? What must I do? And people are very happy to give them a longer list of things to go do. Go do this. Pray a little more. Read a little more. Memorize this do three of these, give enough of that to this organization or whatever, it's very easy for it to go right back into uh, an achievement-based system. And I pray that we would just, uh, as a loved child of yours, uh, be able to look around and uh, keep the commandments without even really realizing we're doing it, but just reflecting the heart that you have for us in the lives of other people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Yeah.